Good afternoon. So when I first got this assignment about compassion, living compassion, I, and they said, you know, give us examples from your life, I was like, hmm. You know, if you were to ask people who know me about me and compassion, I might not make the top of the list. But I, I feel as though I have been fortunate to be around people who make it to the top of the list on the compassion chart, if we have one. And in looking at them and in looking at how they have lived their lives, I think I've learned some lessons that I have from time to time been able to <laughs> apply in my own life. And I think that the first and most fundamental lesson about living compassion that, that I, have, I have learned is that in order to be compassionate to others, you have to be compassionate to yourself. And and, and I, I need to unpack that because I think that very often when we say you need to be compassionate to yourself, people hear you need to make excuses for yourself. And that's not the same thing. To be compassionate to yourself means that you first of all recognize that as a human being, we are all flawed. So that the first, in order to be compassionate, I have to first recognize that I'm not perfect, that I have failings, that, and you know, I come from a family of three siblings, so my failings, I had three people who were more than happy to keep sharing with me what my failings were. But, that, but, but to, to be able to, to look at our own failings and have compassion for that person, have compassion for the times when you wanted to do something amazing and then you walked into that person who just makes you mad and you could not be that gracious, wonderful, caring host that you wanted to be because that person just irks you and you just had to say what you needed to say to him. <laughs> so have compassion for yourself to, to, to be aware that not every day can you be the greatness that you are called to? So starting from a place of looking at myself and looking at my failings and saying, yes, these are failings and these are things that I need to change, but I'm not going to be able to change if the way I approach myself is to constantly beat myself up for those failings. And I think it's important to have that starting place of compassion for ourselves because then it allows us to look at others and recognize that just as I am a human being struggling, trying to make it in this world, trying to make the world slightly better, I hope, that probably almost everybody you meet, and I have to say almost everybody, because I know that there are those people out there that, you know, Jesus is weeping. That, that's all we can say, really. But that almost everyone is in that same position, a person trying to make it through the world, trying to make the world better, maybe not for everybody, maybe just for his or her family, but trying to make a difference in the world for somebody in that, and that they are going to fail. There are going to be times when they fail. There are going to be times when they fail abysmally. And there are going to be times when they fail and it is a cost to you personally or to you as a member of a community. But that if we can at least say, I, I see you, I see you as another human being just like I am. That I see you and believe that you are struggling to be better than you were. And as people who are all struggling, I have a care and a need and a want 
for you to be able to overcome your struggle. And so, compassion for myself, noticing and recognizing that others are struggling as I am. And underneath all of that for me is the recognition of our shared humanity. That you walk in to a situation with someone else from the standpoint of I'm walking into an encounter with another human being. Now, in, in, in the culture that I come from, in our Kasa culture, that um, the highest compliment that we can pay somebody is to say, Ungumtu, which means she or he is really a human being which would seem like pretty low, you know, like it's not a really high ladder to climb people. We're all human, really, you know? So seriously, our culture is like, yeah, you're really a human being. Well done, yeah. Um, but in fact, it actually is much more than that because when we say ungumtu, we say that this is somebody who has looked at other people in their community and has seen somebody of infinite value. That they haven't looked and said, oh, well, you didn't go to school. <laughs> oh, I have three masters. Not me, I don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> but you know, that, that, that is the thing. You know, I, I, oh, that's your house? Uh -huh. Really? Mm. But that, that it starts from, I see another human being. I see a complete human being. And that is where compassion starts. So I, I, I like to tell a, a story of where I, and where I had just an instant of, of, of that place of compassion. And it was during the state of emergencies in South Africa um, in the 80s. And I had just got my driver's license and a credit card and had rented a car. And so, you know, I was all that and a bag of chips in my estimation. <laughs> and so I was driving the car to go and show off to my cousins in Monseyville, which is uh, a, a township on the, other, on the East Rand, West Rand. And so um, I, got in, I got into the car and got stopped at a police roadblock, a, a military roadblock, in fact. And during that time, you know, we would do things to show resistance at the level that we could without getting shot. And so part of the resistance was um, to, to get out of your car with real attitude, right? So, and I was good at it. You know, I was just like, <laughs> And so I'm standing there by my car, and the young man starts searching my car, and I just happen to look at his face, and he looks terrified. And my first thought is, what are you scared of? You and your friends are the ones with the guns. <laughs> but then I just, you know, I, something in me just said, talk to him. And I was like, hey, you know, you must live a really boring life. Here you are on a Friday night searching people's cars. Nothing better to do. <laughs> and so we ended up having a slight conversation for those next four or five minutes as he searched my car. And this would be a really incredibly powerful story if I could now tell you that I am the godmother of his children. <laughs> and we go on vacations together every so... <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what happened after I drove away, but I believe that for that, for me, for that instant, I did not see a South African soldier. I saw another human being. And I believe that for him too, for that few moments, he didn't see a potential terrorist. He saw another human being. And if 
we are to build a compassionate life, a compassionate world. We need to be those who see human beings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Panel, your thoughts, questions? <laughs> absorbing. Yes. We're absorbing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> absorbing is good. Absorbing is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Let me first of all um, applaud you for being so comfortable in the skin that you are in. Mm -hmm. I have always admired you from a distance. And um, the fact that you started your presentation with self-care mm -hmm. is so critical mm -hmm. uh, because you cannot give what you don't possess. Mm -hmm. Your dad's name is Desmond Tutu. How have you been able to stand on your own two feet <laughs> as a woman mm -hmm. and as a brilliant activist in the shadows of your father? Mm. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I have to, I would first of all say I have to give credit really to, to my mother for, yeah. for that. Um, that my mother made it very clear from early in our lives that we were not many Desmonds, you know? Um, and I, I, mean, and would, I mean, people would come to her saying things like, and your daughter, and could you believe she has a priest's daughter? And my mother said, yeah, you just said it, priest's daughter, not priest. He's the only one who chose to go, to, well, now that's a lie, because I went to seminary. <laughs> but uh, at that point, it was like, he's the one, this, that was his life choice. And my children are going to make their own life choices. Good for you. And, and was that with us, too, that yeah. we do not expect you to be us. We expect you to be fully you. And even in those times when I'm sure they, they did wish that particularly I was more them, than I, they, they, they stood the ground and were like, we want you to be fully you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Other questions, thoughts? I was struck by um, your, the very simple but profound compliment of affection of being a human being. There's an actual linguistic parallel in the Arabic language as well. Mm. Uh, it, it simply says, uh, a term of affection, even in colloquial Arabic, is to say, huwa ktir adami. He is, or she is, very Adam-like. Uh, mm -hmm. And this idea that uh, Benny Adam is also translated as a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a reminder almost and a recognition of your, our common spiritual mm. and human origins in mm -hmm. the sense of if you're coming from a faith context from that. But I was also struck as a, a, as a child of Palestinian uh, refugees who've also experienced military occupation, your story. Mm. I'd be interested to hear more from you about moments of navigating, recognizing mutual humanity in the face of military occupation and these persistent stories of trying to reconcile that um, that was a powerful one. Mm -hmm. Are there others that stand out to you? And, and, and what does the lesson still present for us so many years later, do you think? Mm. I mean, I, I, I really do think, as I said in that story, that, you know, it was an instant. It was a few minutes. And, and I think that to expect it to be more is unfair. Mm. Um, that when you are in a situation of um, oppression and occupation and uh, that, that very often um, we, what I, what I have noticed is that so often 
people lift up those among the oppressed who um, bow down, if you like, that, that, that who at least appear to be um, those willing to make peace with oppression in, in some ways. Um, and, and yet, you know, when you talk about the dominant culture, then, then those who are elevated are those who are powerful and, you know, and, and, and rule and do that. So for me, I think it is, it is unfair to say to those who are oppressed that we call on you to constantly recognize the humanity of your oppressor. Uh, that, that, that our responsibility should be to be saying to the oppressor, we demand that you recognize the humanity of those you oppress. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, I, you know, so for me, I use that story because it, it for me it was a, a, a place of compassion for myself that I could see another human being and I could drive away and still be mad at those soldiers, that the fact that I had to go through that. And so that compassion for myself, I was able to transfer some of it to that young man to be thinking, how did you end up yeah. that being who you are and what you are doing?